Welcome back. We talked about viruses in the last movie and we're going to talk about bacteria now. So here are some photos of bacteria. Some are round and have spherical shapes, some have rod shapes, some have spiral shapes. If you see the spherical shaped ones underneath it says uh, cocci and some of these terms might be somewhat familiar like cocci. So when we talk about staphylococcus, which might be a bacteria that you've heard about before, you can see that the root of the name over there on the left. In the center we have something that looks kind of like E. coli. And you can see that E. coli is a bacilli shape. So here is a cartoon of what of the features that most bacteria have. They're usually quite small. They have some cell, cell wall or some encapsulation of various different layers and components. And on the inside, their internal structures and proteins are not formed into any subcellular organelles. So we, they don't have compartmentalization of the different processes and features that they have and the, internally. They perform all of their functions just in the internal cytoplasm, and this is not subdivided or compartmentalized. So in the cartoon, you can see that there is some nucleic acid, DNA, and that is diffuse in the bacteria and that there are other proteins and other functions happening in the cytoplasm but not but but not there's no subdivision so when we say that there is no or there's no nucleus we see the dna is just floating around on the inside and we don't see other internal features and an internal organelles so that is what divides a prokaryote from a eukaryote. So this is a prokaryote that does not have a nuclear a nuclear envelope, so the DNA is just fr free floating inside, and it doesn't have other membrane bound organelles. Early on, it was discovered that we could stain bacteria with a stain called crystal violet, and we could distinguish between two different kinds of bacteria that had that were distinguished by their cell wall and what it was made out of, what it was composed out of. A researcher found that if he put crystal violet on the bacteria, some of the bacteria would take up the crystal violet and would retain it there. And these turned up as bright purple, as you can see in the center picture there. So these were termed gram-positive bacteria. And alternatively, the other bacteria would kind of wash away that violet dye when you wash them. So they had some residual, but let's pretend like they didn't have any dye residual, uh, any residual dye. And these were called gram negative. So they are not stained dark purple. So what is the reason behind this difference in staining? It's the cell wall that the bacteria has. And the gram positive um, bacteria, they have a peptidoglycan. The word peptidoglycan is uh, if we look at the root, we see peptide, which is basically just a protein, and a glycan is a sugar, right? So that if we think about glycemic index, um, words like that, we could think about sugars. So it's just basically a wall that's made out of proteins and sugars. That's all that means. So here, that, that cell wall is very thick, so that's why it's retaining that dye. And the other one, the cell wall is quite thin, and there are other components to the membrane, but that actual protein sugar layer is thin, so it allows the, uh, that dye to wash out. Here is another cartoon demonstrating the same thing. So on the left, we have our gram-positive bacteria. We see that peptidoglycan cell wall is much thicker, so it's retaining that dye, and we know then that when bacteria retain that purple dye, that they have a thicker peptidoglycan cell wall. And the gram-negative bacteria have a much thinner peptidoglycan cell wall. This has important implications for how we treat the, these bacteria with antibiotics. A lot of antibiotics, not all of them, but a lot of them target the peptidoglycan cell wall and kill bacteria by damaging that cell wall. Therefore, you can imagine that the bacteria that have a thick cell wall are going to be more susceptible to those kinds of antibiotics. So it's important for you to remember that these particular kinds of antibiotics are going to affect gram-positive bacteria more than gram-negative. There are a lot of other kinds of antibiotics that target different processes in the bacteria. So some target the 
machinery that bacteria have to make proteins, for example. We are constantly in a state of developing new antibiotics because a lot of the times bacteria become resistant to the antibiotics that we give them, much like we learned in the previous lecture. Consequently, we are constantly working against this rapid evolution that bacteria have to develop new methods of targeting bacteria specifically and killing them without killing uh, the mammalian cells, for example, in the process as well. So bacteria divide very, very rapidly, and this is one of the reasons why they can evolve to um, become antibiotic resistant so quickly. So a human generation is once every 30 years, a bacteria generation is once every 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes, one bacteria divides and becomes two. And we learned that during this division process and when bacteria duplicate their DNA, they introduce mutations into their DNA, so the two daughter cells might be a little bit different. Over time, some of them might have just mu random mutations that might benefit them and might allow them to be antibiotic resistant. Because they divide every 90 minutes, there are a lot of opportunities to have one bacteria that happens to be um, not susceptible to a particular antibiotic. Let's watch the video of this bacteria dividing and we can see, um, so this is a probably E. coli. So they don't timestamp the video unfortunately, but every 20 or 30 minutes one of these bacteria are dividing. Because bacteria have this very rapid doubling time, so they will divide every 20 minutes if all of the conditions are ideal. They do divide a little bit slower if conditions are not ideal, for example, if the temperature is too cold. But if we keep bacteria at 37 degrees centigrade and give them food, they will divide pretty rapidly. Here are the results of an experiment that's been going on for about 18 years at least. This is an experiment by a researcher where they are investigating the evolution of bacteria and what they do is every single day for the last 18 years they've taken a column of bacteria that are growing in a media, so some kind of fluid solution of sugars and salts and uh, foods and amino acids and things that bacteria need to survive. And every day they take a tenth of that solution and put it in a new tube with clean uh, media. So the media again just has, it's sterile, so there's no bacteria in it and there's just food and salts for these bacteria. And over 18 years, which I think was about 50,000 generations, and here they're referring to a generation as um, just every time they they re they re-inoculate a new tube. That doesn't mean that this is the generation time of one uh, bacteria. So each generation here is actually probably maybe six to ten cell divisions of a bacteria. So over 20,000 generations they see a significant increase in fitness of the current E. coli that they are looking at compared to the ancestors. And they've come up with specific metrics of how they look at fitness. And this is a very interesting experiment, so I'll put the link in the additional resources and you can read more about this. But the point that we want to take away from this is that because of their rapid generation time and high mutation rate, bacteria actually can evolve pretty rapidly. So this experiment was over two decades. However, we know that bacteria can evolve um, even in much shorter time scales than that. Here's, here's a summary of the, the different characteristics that bacteria have that allow them to evolve rapidly. They have a lot of genetic variation, and this variation is because of their rapid reproduction, reproductive rates, their mutation rates, and they also have some other characteristics that allow them to swap bacteria between each other. So normally, um, when, a cell, when one bacteria divides into two, it's copying its DNA for the most part pretty accurately, introducing some errors, and the two daughter cells are basically clones of each other. This 
on its own might not contribute to that much genetic diversity, but bacteria have figured out other ways to share pieces of DNA between them. So introducing new forms of DNA and new genetic uh, code is critical to being able to evolve and adapt to an environment. So this comes back to our <clears throat> biodiversity module where we talk about why variability is so important for life to exist and for evolution to occur. So all of these themes are coming together now, I hope. One way that bacteria have new forms of, of DNA introduced into them is through viruses. So we learned about viruses in our last video. Here's a bacteriophage and it's infecting a bacteria. And when these viruses are repackaged in this cartoon here, we see that actually some of the DNA from the donor cell <clears throat> the donor bacteria is packaged into that virus along with all that other virus DNA. So then when that bacteriophage goes to infect another cell, it's actually um, injecting some of the DNA from the donor bacteria cell into that new bacteria there. That is one way where bacteria can have new genes introduced to them. Another way is bacteria will actually just transfer DNA to each other. And they do this through a sex pellet. So here is one bacteria. I believe this one on the left here is the donor. And he has sent out this long protrusion and he's actually just transferring DNA to the other cell. So this is a really great way for bacteria to acquire um, antibiotic resistance. So here's a cartoon of that, of this transfer occurring. and. We don't really need to worry about the details, but suffice it to say, if we look at that top um, cartoon, we see that the bacteria has its main DNA and a large chromosome, and then that F plasma there has some bacterial resist, uh, sorry, antibiotic resistance, and when these two bacteria come together through that mating bridge, that um, parent bacteria is actually transferring that resistance to the next bacteria. So bacteria have a number of ways to stay ahead of the curve. We have kind of been broaching the subject, but how exactly does antibiotic resistance occur? Through natural selection. It's important to remember that bacteria don't choose to become resistant to a particular antibiotic. There is genetic variability that occurs randomly and naturally with no intention and sometimes it occurs in a way that will allow those bacteria that have mutated in that way to overcome an obstacle, a local environmental obstacle. That does not mean that they want it to become resistant. So it's a random chance of that happening. But, and it happens to a very low extent, a lot of the times mutations are actually detrimental to the organism that is experiencing them. So in this case, we have a lot of bacteria, a lot of mutations going on, a lot of division and swapping of DNA and genetic variability, and one or two of these happen to have a mutation that makes them resistant to a particular antibiotic. So when you administer that antibiotic, all of those yellow ones that are not resistant are going to die off, or most of them, and those red ones, which are not um, susceptible to the antibiotic, will continue to divide and eventually will overtake that population. So humans have affected antibiotic resistance uh, very dramatically by administering antibiotics in large doses and in a, lar in a lot of different situations. Um, we've created a lot of these, we've enhanced the presence of a lot of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. So a lot of our livestock are given antibiotics constantly, so that's one way we have created a large population of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and in other ways too, you can read this infographic at your own pace. And let's look at the spread of antibiotic resistance over time. So you might imagine that the more you know, the, the, as we continue to try to fight off bacteria and try to um, kill them off in various ways, they're going to also be fighting the fight on the other end by um, having their random mutations, and some of these mutations are going to be beneficial and give them resistance to the antibiotics. So as a result, we do see increases of antibiotic resistance in, against um, bact bacteria, and these are the different kinds of antibiotics that they are looking at. 
And they are showing you that over time there has been a decrease in the efficacy of some of these against a larger percent of the population of microbes that we are interested in protecting ourselves from. That is our bacteria lecture. Thank you for listening.